I'm, um, I'm Tom Fielden, I'm the science correspondent and an assistant editor on the Today programme. And it's a great pleasure uh, um, to welcome you all here today to this special event, the first in a new season, the autumn season here at the RSA. Um, just before we begin though, I just uh, a few housekeeping rules if you like. Um, could I ask you to make sure your mobile phones are switched to silent at the very least? And we are live streaming um, the event today. So as usual, welcome to all our um, web viewers and listeners. And a reminder, the hashtag for this event, if you want to join in, take part, is uh, hashtag RSA Sapiens, if you want to get involved in the discussion on Twitter. Now, with the housekeeping uh, notices over, it really is a great pleasure to introduce this afternoon's event and our distinguished uh, uh, speaker, the historian, Dr. Yuval Harari. Uh, um, for those of you who don't know, um, Yuval Noah Harari has a PhD in history from the University of Oxford. He now lectures at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And he lectures on an incredibly broad range of, of, of world history. And I really do mean in the most broad terms, the relationship between history and biology, justice, happiness, uh, um, and of course, the history of Homo sapiens. Um, I understand 65,000 people have signed up for his online course, A Brief History of Humankind, which is really what we're here to talk about today. His latest book, Sapiens, is already an international bestseller and is being published in more than 20 languages worldwide. Um, in 2012, Harari was awarded the annual Polonsky Prize for creativity and originality, and I certainly think that's true of, of Sapiens. Um, on a more personal note, I'm, I'm really, really pleased to finally um, have met Yuval. It is a great pleasure, and um, I need to thank you, actually, because it's not often you come across a book like this where from the very first line you just think, wow, I wish I'd thought of that, I wish I could have written that. Um, but certainly that is true of, of Sapiens. And the next time I get to, uh, to talk to a colleague who comes up to me and says, well, why haven't you written your book yet? Um, I can just point to Sapiens and say, it's all right, it's been taken care of, it's done. I don't have to, uh, I don't have to do that. This is the book that I would have written if I could have written a book quite like this. It really is a remarkable piece of work. So with that, I'm just going to introduce Yuval, ask you to come up here. He's going to talk for about 20 minutes and show you some slides, and um, we'll take it from there. Yuval. So hello, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to see all of you here. And I would like to uh, use the next 20 minutes to speak about some things that interest us very much about ourselves about our species, Homo sapiens, to understand how our species from all the different animals on the planet came to dominate, uh, to control planet Earth, which was not obvious at all. If you go back 70,000 years ago, you find that the planet is populated by many different kinds of humans, many species of humans. Homo sapiens was just one of them. And all these humans, the most important thing to know about them is that they were unimportant creatures. 70,000 years ago, there were less than one million humans of all species together, and their impact on the ecosystem was minimal, like that of gorillas today, far less than that, say, of jellyfish or bumblebees. And as you fast forward to today, you find that there is only one human species left, our species Homo sapiens, but we completely dominate this planet. We basically own this planet. And the big question is, how did we do it? How did we uh, conquer Earth? And when this question is raised, the question of our secret of, secret of success, people usually turn to the individual level they want to believe, they want to feel that there is something special about me personally, that I am so much superior to a chimpanzee or to a baboon or to a dog or to an elephant or anything else, and this is why things like me, humans, this is why they control the planet. But the fact is that on the individual level, we are not so unique, we are not so smart, we are not so powerful. 
If you put me and the chimpanzee on a lone island together and we had to struggle for survival, I would definitely put my bets on the chimpanzee, <laughs> not on myself. And this is not something special about myself. I think it's true about most people, that if you put them alone with the chimpanzee, that's the end. I mean, the chimpanzee will definitely win over. So it's not an individual level. It's not something about my body. It's not something inside my brain. It's something else. It's something outside. It's actually something on the collective level. If you put a thousand chimpanzees and a thousand humans on a lone island, then the humans will win quite easily for the simple reason that a thousand chimpanzees can never cooperate effectively. This is the real secret, secret of success of Homo sapiens, the ability to cooperate in large numbers and flexibly. Now, there are other animals that can cooperate effectively in large numbers. The social insects, ants and bees are the obvious example. However, ants and bees are very inflexible in the way that they cooperate. If they encounter a new situation, a new danger, a new opportunity, they cannot reinvent the social system, the way that they cooperate in the, in the uh, colony or in the beehive in order to uh, face this new challenge. So they cooperate in very large numbers, but in a rigid way. Other social animals, like the chimpanzees, like the dolphins, like the elephants, they can cooperate in a much more flexible way. However, they do so only in small numbers because cooperation among them is based on intimate knowledge. I have to know the other chimpanzee in order to cooperate with him or her. I cannot cooperate with strangers. Homo sapiens, the really unique thing about our species is the ability to combine both these things, to cooperate in large numbers, far larger than the ants and the bees, and to do it flexibly, far more flexibly, in fact, than the chimpanzees or the elephants or the dolphins. So this is the real secret of success of our story, of our, our species, sorry. We are the only animal that can cooperate flexibly in large numbers, and this is the basis for the uh, immense power that political networks of humans gain, that economic system, trade system, of religions, of churches, of all the various things that humans have managed to accomplish during their history are not the accomplishment of a single individual, but they are always the accomplishment of a network of cooperation of many different individuals, and in particular, many strangers. Take even this lecture as an example. What's happening now in this hall cannot happen with chimpanzees. Chimpanzees never give lectures to strangers. <laughs> now, if you take, say, maybe there are 100 people here in the, in the room now, if you cram together 100 chimpanzees who never met before, you will get chaos. But with people, you can get an event like this, an intellectual uh, exchange. I don't know most of the people here in the room, and you don't, know really, you don't really know me, and many of you probably don't know each other, and nevertheless, we can cooperate in a very orderly manner to create this event, this intellectual exchange. Now, cooperation is not always nice, Sometimes when people say cooperation, they think about Sesame Street and how to teach children to cooperate, to cooperate with one another, and it sounds very, very, very nice. But cooperation is also the basis for all the horrible things that humans have been doing, are doing. Prisons are also a system of cooperation between strangers, and so are armies and arms factories and concentration camps. These are all based on the same thing on large-scale cooperation between strangers. So it's not always nice. But the next big question that arises, suppose that, yes, maybe I managed to convince you that large-scale cooperation is the basis for the sapient success. The next question 
that comes in mind is how come Homo sapiens, alone of all the animals, is able to weave these giant networks of cooperation between strangers, which chimpanzees or dolphins or elephants cannot. So the answer, the short answer to this uh, question is the human imagination. If you examine any large-scale human cooperation, you will find that at its basis are imaginary stories, stories that people invent and believe and tell one another. And as long as many people believe in the same imaginary story, they follow the same rules and laws and obey the same norms and the same values. The real secret of success of our species is that we alone can talk about things that don't exist at all, anywhere, except in our own imagination, in the stories that we invented. All the other animals, they too communicate. Chimpanzees communicate, and dolphins communicate, and elephants communicate, but they communicate information about things that really exist. They talk about trees, they talk about rivers, they talk about lions, about, they, about predators, about things like that. Humans know how to talk about all these things, but also humans can talk about things that don't exist at all, like gods, like money, like nations, like human rights, all these things that we ourselves invented and that exist only in our shared stories. You can never convince a chimpanzee to do something, say to give you a banana, by promising that chimpanzee that after you die, you know what happens? You will go to chimpanzee heaven, and there you will receive lots and lots of bananas for your good deeds. No chimpanzee will ever be convinced by such a story to do anything. Only us, only homo sapiens, can believe such stories and can be motivated for action by such stories. And this is why we control the world and the chimpanzees are locked up in zoos and research laboratories. And if you check, it's not just religion. The easiest example to give is, of course, religion. But it's not just religion. It's the same with our legal system, with our political system, with our economic system. Money is also just a story. Chimpanzees and dolphins and wolves, none of them Man uses money. None of them, they, they can exchange things. I give you a banana, you give me coconut. But the idea of money, this is something unique to humans because, again, it is based on a story about something that exists only in our imagination. We take, say, a piece of paper or a piece of gold, which is worth nothing. You can't do anything with gold. You can't eat it, you can't drink it, you can't wear it, you can't even make weapons out of it because it's too soft. So you take something without any inherent value and you tell a story. Look, this piece of worthless metal or this piece of colorful paper, it is worth 10 bananas. And if enough people believe that story, then it becomes an extremely effective story. So it's not just a religion. Even the uh, bank managers and the finance ministers, they are incredibly creative and powerful storytellers. And their stories are what moves the world. Their, their stories is what enables us to weave these systems of cooperation where millions of strangers are willing to do amazing things and sometimes terrible things just for these colorful pieces of paper. So this is the power of the human imagination. So we see then that Homo sapiens, in contrast to all the other animals in the world, Homo sapiens lives in a dual reality. Other animals, like the baboons or alligators or lions, they live inside an objective reality made of trees and rivers and other animals and clouds and winds and whatnot. We humans also live in this reality. We also encounter trees and lions and, and rivers and mountains, but we also have another reality. In addition to this objective reality, we also live 
inside a fictional reality, a reality that we invented, that exists only in our imagination, a reality that contains things like nations, which are just the stories that we invented, which contains money, which is populated by gods, which includes things like human rights, which again, it's our invention. And what is amazing about history is not only that humans inhabit this dual reality, the, the layer of objective reality and or, or on it another layer of fictional reality, what is really amazing is that over time, fictional reality has become more and more powerful until we reach the situation today when the very survival of trees and rivers and lions and chimpanzees depends on the imaginary stories that Homo sapiens has invented. Aboriginal Australians, they explain the world, what is happening in the world, by one of their key concepts is the concept of dream time, according to which we actually inhabit a dream world created by the dreams of mythical beings. These beings dream the world and we live inside the, the dreams of, of these mythical beings. And this, in my view, is an extremely accurate depiction of the world. We are living inside the dreams of mythical entities like the European Union and like Google and like the dollar, which exist nowhere except in these fictional stories. And you can test yourself, you can check for yourself Try to see what are you thinking about, what are you worried about during your day-to-day -day life. Many people find that they think very little about real things like trees and rivers and lions. And most of the day, they are constantly preoccupied by these fictional inventions like money and like nations and like gods and corporations and things like that. So thank you for listening. And um, I hope that uh, your dreams will be uh, more interesting after this lecture. <laughs>
You don't really get into exactly what happened there. I mean, it's enough that it did, isn't it? Because we're talking about how it was us, not really why. And not really why. Um, there is a big controversy about what happened to all the other species. We know now for, for almost for certain that 70,000 years ago, there were at least six different species of humans on the planet, which may sound strange because we are used to thinking about ourselves as the only humans, and how can it be different species of humans, but we just need to look around the other animals, and as you said, there are many species of bears, like grizzly bears and polar bears and black bears and brown bears, so why have just one species of humans? And in fact, it wasn't like this. Uh, 60, 70,000 years ago, there were many, many species of humans. What happened to all the rest is one of the biggest questions of history. Um, apparently, I think it's quite obvious that Homo sapiens had a hand in the disappearance of all our <laughs> siblings. We don't have like the smoking gun that we can prove it, but it seems very uh, credible that we had something to do with it. It wasn't just pure coincidence. And I think it's not only one of the biggest questions of history, it's, always, it's also one of the biggest thought experiments to try and imagine how the world would have looked like if at least one other species of humans had survived. What would the world look like today in the 21st century if besides all the other divides of humanity, rich and poor and men and women and Muslims and Christians and all that, you, we also had to deal with sapiens and Neanderthals. What kind of world would that have been? It's, it's an amazing thought experiment. But we do get down to just one. And then it all goes horribly wrong, doesn't it? Because we, we, we go for agriculture <laughs> as opposed to hunter-gatherers. Uh, and, and in a very real sense, we end up being enslaved in that process, don't we? Yes, agriculture is usually seen as a great leap forward for humankind. And from the perspective, say, of the affluent middle class today in the West, it does seem a good idea because it's the basis for everything we have. But uh, we are not the typical post-agricultural uh, human. The much more typical and uh, important perspective is, for example, of a simple peasant woman in uh, ancient Egypt. If you think about the agricultural revolution from the viewpoint of a simple peasant woman in, in, in pharaonic Egypt, then agriculture looks like a terrible idea because the life, the daily life of the average woman, as far as we know, in ancient Egypt was much harder than the life of the average hunter-gatherer uh, 20,000 years earlier. You had a far worse diet, you had to, to work much longer, and most importantly, the work was much harder. The human body and the human mind were adapted by hundreds of thousands of years of evolution to the life of hunter-gatherers running after gazelles and sniffing for mushrooms in, in, in the forest. It wasn't adapted to the grueling work of agriculture, of digging canals and carrying water buckets and, and, and harvesting and all that. And that even without mentioning uh, uh, social stratification and exploitation, which are also apparently the result of the agricultural revolution. I'm going to take a, a giant leap forwards through history here, uh, uh, several uh, uh, thousand years to, I'm a science correspondent, and I want to get on to the <laughs> industrial and scientific revolutions, because I think you've got a really interesting uh, take on what was so different about that, and perhaps why uh, the West has come to dominate subsequently mm -hmm. in its attitude towards science and this idea of um, it's not what you know it's not like a revealed religion where everything is known and all there is is, is filling in daily existence the, 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 the fundamental idea underpinning science is that we don't know and we need to go out there and find out and that seems to drive us forward in another one of these mm -hmm. these great moments of, of, of where everything takes a, a leap forward yeah I think that the the greatest discovery of the scientific revolution was the discovery of ignorance. And the discovery that, wait a minute, we don't understand the world. We don't know what's happening here. What's, all these revelations and scriptures, they don't give us the correct answers to the most important questions. We still have to find out these answers. And I think until today, as a scientist myself, 
The thing I like most about science is that if you don't know something, you can just say, I don't know. It's not like a, 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 a rabbi or a priest which must have the answers. If we don't know, for example, and we don't know as far as I know, why uh, Homo sapiens uh, evolved this unique language, how come sapiens and not Neanderthals? So I'm, in, I'm perfectly within my right as a scientist to come to you and say, I don't know, we are still researching that. And that, I think, is a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing. Okay, well, I'm going to throw it open now because, I mean, I could go on and on, and I think maybe we'll, uh, we'll, we'll come to one or two other areas, uh, particularly where we've got to now and, and the kind of mm -hmm. the moment we're at at the moment. Perhaps we can get some, some questions from the floor. There are some hands going up here. We've got a microphone coming around, so perhaps if you could, uh, if you could wait. There's a, a gentleman at the back there. Why don't we start at the back? Uh, um, if you speak clearly into the microphone and, and, and if you can limit it to a question rather than a, 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 your own imagine, in a, imagination and, <laughs> and, and dream, uh, dreamscape, that would be okay. great. I'll make no imaginations. Um, I just wondered whether and how you can reconcile your view of Homo sapiens succeeding through this innate ability to make communities and large communities on the one hand and the to me, obvious fact that human society is extremely selfish. Well, um, humans are, like other animals, they are selfish, but from a biological perspective, I think the salient feature of our species is that we are social animals. We cannot survive by ourselves. The idea that humans began like this social contract mythology, that humans were at first individuals pursuing their own egotistic aims, and at some point they began to come together uh, by some social contract to form society, uh, it's, as far as I know, incorrect from a biological perspective. Society or the group comes before the individual. Uh, human being cannot survive without um, the social system around him or her. And actually, as history evolves, the individuality of humans decrease. We become ever more dependent upon larger and larger groups. And the best evidence for that is the shrinking of the human mind. Over the last 10,000 years, since the agricultural revolution, our, our not, not the mind, sorry, the brain. Um, over the last 10,000 years, the brains of Homo sapiens is, has been shrinking. And uh, the reason for that is that we need to know less and less on the individual level in order to survive. And we become more dependent on the other. On, as a hunter-gatherer, I needed to know a lot of things myself, how to hunt, how to gather, how to prepare my food, how to prepare my clothes, how to prepare my uh, weapons and, and tools. As today, a historian, I just need to know history. I get paid for that, and then I take this money and I buy everything. I have no idea how to grow wheat. I have no idea, like my shoes, if you put a gun to my head and tell me, you need to produce now these shoes or you die, then I die. I have absolutely no idea even what is it made of. How do you start even making a shoe? I don't know, I just know history. So, I need a smaller brain. <laughs> we had a, a, a question down here at the front. Thank you. Um, my name is Malcolm Aiken. Uh, I found the conclusion of the, the end of history at the end of your book rather pessimistic. And I wonder how much of that is a result of the assumption of evolutionary psychologists that we are as evolution left us. That we but are? We are as evolution left us. Mm. Um, because it's almost axiomatic that if evolution has come to an end, it's going to be rather pessimistic. You say quite early in the book that our genes think we are still running around the savannah. And I want to know how you support that when the genes of 90% of the people in this room know that although we've weaned, we still drink milk. Mm -hmm. um, or is it that, that this end of evolution is merely a dream rather than being a reality? Mm. I wanted to ask you about this as well, actually, which is about this point that that's the revolution we're in now, isn't it? Mm. The moment at which we might choose to step outside 
evolution by natural selection might start to augment ourselves, might start to move into some sort of uh, dystopian mm -hmm. future. But uh, why don't you tell us about that? Well, whether it's good or bad, dystopian or utopian, let's leave it aside for a minute. I think the important thing to realize is that we are, I think, moving from an uh, evolutionary process by natural selection, which was the um, dominant principle of life for four billion years on Earth, to a kind of new era in which natural selection is replaced by intelligent design. We can start re-engineer other animals and ourselves with genetic engineering, with direct brain-computer interfaces and all kinds of nanotechnology and other new technologies. And this, this opens up immense new opportunities for a new kind of evolution. Now, it is true that evolution never stops. It's not that like 70,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, somebody hits the brakes and that's it, no more evolution. It goes on, and the example with the milk is an excellent example. Uh, 20,000 years ago, humans did not drink milk as adults, certainly not cow, cow's milk. But over the last 10,000 years, since the advent of agriculture, certain population of humans, especially in the Middle East, parts of Africa and Europe, uh, evolved with natural selection this ability to digest the milk of uh, certain mammals, like cows. So evolution, yeah, natural selection is still going on, but it is much slower, it's very slow. 10,000 years is not a lot of time in evolutionary terms. I think that if we, again, do a thought experiment, if we take a baby born to hunter-gatherers 20,000 years ago and transport it in time and raise him or her today in, say, the UK, I don't think that there will be uh, big differences, either physical or emotional and cognitive. Yes, he or she probably would not be able to digest milk, but in many other respects, I don't think there will be a big difference. However, as we look to the future, this slow process of uh, evolution by natural selection may well be replaced in the next few decades by a new process of uh, intelligent design of ourselves and other creatures. And if this indeed happens, it will not only be the greatest revolution in history, it will also be the greatest revolution in biology. After four billion years of natural selection, life will start evolving according to a completely different principle. You say you don't take a view on whether it's a good or a bad thing, but you do talk about uh, it inevitable, uh, inevitably being, perhaps in the 21st century, that because the rich are always the first to access new technologies mm -hmm. uh, and there'll always be another upgrade that mm -hmm. the rich can afford once, even if you, 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 the, the first few get uh, dissipated out into society, there'll always be uh, 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 another plus. Thing, yeah, yeah. yeah, another uh, an iPhone 6 or, or, or whatever it, it, uh, it comes to be. Um, there's room there for, for really serious inequality. And I'm wondering if you, if you see that going as far as speciation, that there might actually not be a future for Homo sapiens, or if it is, it might be uh, as a, a enslaved by a, by a higher caste, mm -hmm. if you look. Yeah, I think there is a, again, it's not a prediction, and the, the important thing is to just grasp the possibility that we are now at a stage in history where the speciation and the existence of several species of humans simultaneously on Earth is again a possibility. We can't be sure if it happens or not, but it is now possible again. And this is because science and medicine in particular is uh, undergoing a, a, a big revolution. In the 20th century, medicine, the main aim of medicine, of the medical establishment, was to heal the sick. In the 21st century, the main aim will probably be to upgrade the healthy. So from healing the sick, we are moving to upgrading the healthy. And when you deal with healing the sick, this is basically an egalitarian project because you have a vision 
of some kind of norm. This is what it means to be a healthy human being. And you try to push anybody who falls below the norm, you try to push them up. So they reach the norm until in a perfect world, everybody are the same, everybody are healthy. But now as we move on, and they say, no, we want to upgrade the healthy, not just heal the sick, there is no more norm. The whole idea of upgrade is to go beyond the norm. And this is, in essence, an anti-egalitarian project. It's an elitist project. Because there is, even if some particular upgrade becomes very cheap, and everybody has it, so you want the next thing and the next thing. And you have here a real possibility of opening, for the first time in history, big biological gaps between rich and poor. Throughout history, the rich always believe, usually believed, that they are better, they are smarter, they are uh, more uh, moral, more ethical, That's they are more rational, rich, right? whatever. <laughs> this is why we are rich, of course. But as far as many historians and social scientists and philosophers believe, this is not the case. The rich did not become richer because they are better. There was no real difference between rich and poor. But in the future, we might reach a situation in which this will be a fact, that rich people really are better than the rest, because they have all these kind of, of new, up, new upgrades. Sapiens 2, Sapiens 3, and, and so forth. Let's get back to the floor. Are there any more questions? Yes, here at the front. Hi, thanks very much. My name is Josephine Green. Um, I'd like to introduce a bit of optimism into this. Um, here's a question. It's a lengthy bit, but uh, stay with me. Um, throughout history, there's always been a meta-narrative of story, which has been based on scarcity. The idea that there's not enough to go around, therefore we must fight, we must compete, and the winners and losers. But what I think is interesting now is at the beginning of the 21st century, and particularly with a networked society, a complex network but connected society, could you envisage a new meta-narrative emerging, one based not on scarcity but on abundance? By that I mean that our most abundant resource is people. I'm not talking about abundance in material terms, I'm talking about abundance in terms of capacity. So are we at the cusp now that we can liberate, not superhuman being rich people, Ray 1, 2 and 3, but through liberating and democratizing human capacity, which is the capacity to innovate, to create resilience, readiness, and liberate the values that support the collective, which is sharing, collaborating, even love, is it possible now that we could actually live in a state of abundance rather than scarcity, which might change and be another big game changer in macro history as to our development? Thank you. Um, uh, definitely, I think this meta-narrative is in fact the meta-narrative of capitalism. Uh, for most of history, people viewed, especially the economic situation, as a zero-sum game, there is scarcity. If I have a bigger piece of the pie, somebody else must have a smaller piece. That, that's the way it goes. And then enter Adam Smith, and he says, no, it can be a win-win situation. The pie can grow, and the pie grows through these uh, connections, through trade, through specialization, on the collective level, so that Everybody can have more and more, and then as this process continues, we may eventually reach a, a state of abundance in which everybody has any, everything they want. Now, whether it's true or not, it's a very big uh, question, there are a lot of debates and arguments, but I think this is now the dominant meta-narrative of the world, especially in the economic field. We have moved from a zero-sum game view of the world to a win-win situation view of the world, at least in the economic sphere. This is a discussion, but I, I really don't want to take it to the material. I think we have many mm -hmm. problems. <laughs> but, you know, we can start to think of an alternative development model, small, local, open, connected. So we're getting away from all the exploitation of hierarchies and concentration. So it's not so much the material, I feel, in that in a mm. potential abundant meta-narrative you know, we will see, as we see in the social innovation movement, um, a much more sharing, access, not ownership. So I think 
the puzzle gets fitted together and the abundance paradigm allows us to go in a different direction on many levels. Are we talking here about imaginary stories and we now are in a position perhaps to write our own stories how we would like them to, you know, to, to decide what the ending is going to be and for it to be a much more egalitarian one than, than perhaps we have felt that we were enthralled to the march of, of time and history and, and, and certain forces, if you like, out there, that we might actually, instead of having that future where we, we choose to let the model go on as it is but now apply a new level of, uh, uh, of ability to augment humans, we might try and rewrite that imaginary story. Definitely, I think that... Uh, um, I mean, it's been tried before by Marx and various other people, but I mean... <laughs> well, you can always try again, even though the last time we tried it ended so badly that people don't have the stomach for, for a new attempt. But I think that even previously, um, the idea of scarcity was much more in the stories that people hold in their minds than in the actual world. When you look at human conflicts throughout history, there is a widespread belief that it's a kind of struggle, kind of conflict uh, resulting from biological reasons that humans fight for the same reasons that chimpanzees or wolves fight, that they fight on, uh, uh, about food and about mates. And I don't think it's true. I'm a military historian by profession, I mean, before I became a world historian, and my impression is that, uh, with some exceptions, the vast majority of human conflicts during history were not about food, were not about mates, were not about actual uh, uh, scarcity. They were about the stories in people's minds. Uh, if you think about, say, the, uh, uh, the conflict in my country between Israelis and Palestinians, there is plenty of food between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. You can feed everybody. There is no scarcity of food. There is no scarcity even of territory. Everybody can build their houses. There is enough. But the problem is that you have two very different stories. And so far, we didn't have the fortune to have this genius storyteller who could come up with the third story and convince everybody to agree on the, on the same story. And this is true of most wars in history. We are now marking the 100th anniversary of the First World War. There was enough food in Europe in 1914. The war wasn't really about food. So from this perspective, I think that if we really are able to change the stories in people's mind, then many of these conflicts uh, uh, can be solved. However, it's very difficult to change the stories mm. in people's mind. I thought we were going to get on to the third way and uh, Bill Clinton and Tony <laughs> Blair there for a moment. No, no. But, uh, <laughs> yes, if you get over here, can we get the microphone? Thank you. Um, my question relates around, there's a theme here all about the natural world, the ants, the bees, bears, etc., and humans within that. What happens with humans when they come to the point where they're creating artificial? So we leave nature behind. Are we really capable of creating something that could actually be more powerful than ourselves? How will we manage that and how will we reconcile that? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if, if it will work, but we are trying to do it. This is why it's also very dangerous. And uh, most, you know, there is this scientific mythology. Like every, like other religions, science too has its own mythology. And the main theme in scientific mythology is this Frankenstein story or the Matrix story in which people try to create something better, but they mismanage it and they create some terrible monster. And uh, it is a, a, a possibility, but it doesn't stop us for, from trying. And uh, we already see it today that we are trying both to upgrade ourselves and to create completely artificial things that may replace us in more and more uh, fields and areas. Every year or two, we hear about a new invention from Google or Microsoft or somebody that um, does things that even five or ten years ago when were considered completely beyond the capability 
of algorithms and computers. Like 20 years ago, nobody believed that a computer could beat the uh, uh, chess champion of the world in, in chess. And 10 years ago, nobody thought that it would be possible for a computer to drive a car. And now Google has done that. And even with art, sometimes people think, OK, when the computers will take over everything, we'll still have art. And everybody will become artists. And everybody will be a Beethoven or a Picasso or whatever. But the thing is that we now have computer programs who create art. They write music that most people find indistinguishable and even better than music created by humans. So uh, there is a very big question mark hanging over this entire project. But I don't think that this is going to stop us uh, from trying. Whether it's pessimistic or optimistic, uh, I leave aside. So there's one there. And then could we come to these two over here? But we'll start with you over there, sir. Um, I'm curious as is the aspect of where art, the arts fit in your scheme. Uh, why did music, poetry, uh, uh, all the other arts, why did they appear according to your scheme? What purpose do they serve? You mentioned that you know, we could be going into a computer-dominated art um, situation, but why did they start? Hmm. Well, I don't have an explanation for how we gained the, the, the ability to invent stories and art and all that. But given this ability, art is extremely important, of the utmost importance, for our species and for our success as a species. Because, uh, again, our success depends on large-scale cooperation. And large-scale cooperation depends on inventing a story and convincing lots of strangers to believe all of them to believe in the same story. And in order to do that, art is far more important than mathematics or physics or chemistry. You need mathematics and physics and, and chemistry to create tools, to create cars, to create airplanes. But when you try to convince 10 million people to believe in the same story, invented story, fictional story, mathematics is not going to help you. Here you need art. And this is the real, the immense importance of artistic creation for, uh, uh, for human history. It's this ability to shape and to spread these common stories, these common myths among millions of strangers. There were two people down here. Oh, yes, sir. <coughs> yeah, I just wanted to clarify in my own mind the purpose of why we have the stories. And you're saying we have the stories in order to give us a structure with which to cooperate with other people. Is that, that's the main point that, uh, that you're making. Mm -hmm. And it, does it also then also make us feel different from other people? Because you have your stories and my, I have my stories. And that then leads to conflicts. Mm. So that's very, that, that doesn't work very well, does it, for <laughs> the future of mankind, humankind? Well, yeah, when different groups have different stories, this is a big problem. But what we see as history evolve, unfolds is that some stories spread around and manage to unite more and more people behind them. It's not necessarily the best stories. It's not necessarily the most rational stories. It's the most successful stories. And what makes a story successful, it's sometimes extremely surprising. When you look at the world in the year, say, 100 AD, who could have imagined that the story of Christianity would become so successful? And um, why, was why was it? I don't know. It's a very big surprise. I mean, you see this esoteric Jewish sect with this kind of extremely uh, creative story, let's say, about God incarnating himself as a human born to a virgin, crucified for our sins, doesn't sound very convincing, but... <laughs> but it won the Roman Empire. I mean, reason, yeah, it, it takes over and conquers the world. And how, how, how it manages to do so, I don't know. I think that in many cases, the successful stories, there are a lot of accidents 
uh, behind their success. A story, again, it doesn't need to be true. It doesn't need to be rational. It doesn't even need to be very clear. Some of the most successful stories in history are actually unclear. You don't understand exactly. But this is part of the magic of the story. And some stories do succeed in taking over the entire world. Perhaps the best example is money. If you think about the story of the dollar, everybody believes in it. Even people like Osama bin Laden, who hated American culture and American politics and American society and everything to do in Ameri with America he hated, except American dollars. <laughs> These he was quite fond of, had no objection at all to getting American dollars. So you have this wonderful story that, look, even, even people who hate each other are willing to accept at least this same story about these colorful pieces of paper. So you have to be lucky rather than being best or most logically appropriate story. Yeah. There's an element, a strong element of luck in there. There was a gentleman next to you there. Um, there are certain communities who have rejected a number of uh, the developments of society, such as the Amish, uh, who have say they, they uh, take themselves outside of the realms of what we would call normal society, but they still have their story. They still have the background to what, why they are living in that way. Mm -hmm. To your knowledge, are there any communities who have rejected this sort of conditioning of these intangibles, these fictions? Um, and if there haven't been, could you speculate as to if we tried to do this, would we be able to do it? Would we be able to fall back on animal instincts, both of compassion and cooperation, which don't rely on fictions? Mm -hmm. Or do you think it would be a complete disaster? I think that the main problem is that, at least with Homo sapiens as, as we know it, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to intimately know more than 150 individuals. There have been many sociological and psychological studies about this, and somewhere around the number 150, there is this magical borderline. You can know quite well 100 people, 120, but you cannot know intimately 200 people, or 500 people, or 1,000 people. And therefore, it is possible to create a well-functioning, intimate community of, say, 100 persons, which is not based on belief in some gods or national myth or money or whatever. It's just based on intimate knowledge and relations between one another. But as you cross the 150 li uh, mark line and you try to construct cooperation between 10,000 people or 100,000 people, it's impossible as far as we know. At least we don't have any example of a big society, say of 100,000 people, that manages to survive and to uh, work effectively without some kind of these communal stories that everybody uh, believes in. And you can see it in many, in many uh, uh, areas, like in the economy, you have small family businesses of, say, 20 employees. Everybody knows everybody else. Everything works fine, even without rules and regulations and hierarchies. But if this small uh, family firm succeeds and grows and grows and now have 500 employees or 5,000 employees, it will have, it, will, uh, it, will, it is necessary that it will start having these hierarchies and rules or regulations or it will collapse. You must have them at, at that point. There's someone down here, while, while you're getting there, can I just ask you a question which is yeah. about, and maybe just to do with the kind of structure of the book that you sort of start at the beginning and, and come up to the, to, to the modern day. Is there an inevitability about that? Because, I mean, at various points about that, if we go from the cognitive revolution and everything follows on from that when people start uh, uh, de developing these imaginary stories, I mean... Religion fits in somewhere in the middle of, of mm. that, and I'm wondering if you feel that it's had its day, in a sense, because a lot of people, uh, certainly at the moment, would disagree and mm. disagree very forcefully uh, uh, at the moment. Uh, is there an inevitability that we move through that period and into this future where we start to augment ourselves or, or whatever? Um, I don't think that religion is bound to disappear. It depends on the definition of religion. If by religion we mean 
a very narrow definition of belief in some great gods, then it wasn't even, uh, it, it, it wasn't even common to all people during history. You have many religions in history, for example, Buddhism, in which gods are not very important. So if you have this narrow definition, I think religion is characteristic of only part of humanity, part of history, and it's probably had its day and it's on the way out. These traditional theist religions centered around great gods, uh, still billions of people believe in that. But I think that um, the direction of history that history is taking will leave those kinds of religions behind. However, if you think about religion in the broader sense of a belief in some superhuman order, that there is some law, some principle, some power, which is stronger than human, more, which humans cannot change, and that all our norms and values emanate from this higher order, then this is something that every, every society has, including modern secular society. And this is something that is not going to disappear because it's the basis for human cooperation. The way that you convince people to believe in a certain fundamental story is to tell them, this is not something I invented. This story comes from some superhuman source the two main sources are either some god or the laws of nature. You come to people and you say, this story, it's not my invention, these are the laws of nature, and therefore we cannot change it, therefore we must follow it. And this kind of story is still with us today. This is the way that many people think about human rights. They think they are natural, it's not something that people invented, it's something that humans naturally, nature decreed, that we have a right to life, a right to liberty. Now, from a scientific perspective, it's obviously not true. It's obvious, no, people invented that. It's not nature. But many people today, liberal, seculars who don't believe in God, still have this idea of a, a, an order coming from above. And this will probably continue to be in the 21st century with all these amazing technological uh, developments, because technology by itself doesn't instruct us what to do with it. In order to decide what to do with technology, we need some kind of story, of ideology, of religion. And therefore, I think that the most interesting place today, from a religious perspective, is not the Middle East, but it's Silicon Valley. The new religions, that will take over the world, that are beginning now to take over the world, will come from Silicon Valley. Yeah, I think we've got time for just one more, if we can be very quick. Um, my name is Nicola. I'm from Six Heads. And um, I'm thinking about the challenges facing Homo sapiens, whether they're objective reality or not, around climate change and inequality and what that means in terms of distribution of resources and thinking about how we need to change the narrative in certain ways to deal with that. And I was wondering whether you had any examples of really good ways that in the past um, the narrative has changed that we could draw on to really more quickly try and change this narrative okay. that we all hold at the moment. You're going to have to do that very quickly if you very can quickly. just sum it all up in one final answer. This is why I think Silicon Valley is the most interesting place in terms of religion today. A successful story needs to be updated. It needs to understand the situation it addresses. I think the mullahs and rabbis and, and priests in the Middle East don't understand the 21st century. Therefore, they cannot construct a good story for that century. I think the people in Silicon Valley understand the world much better. And therefore, their stories, they can be completely imaginary, but they will be far more relevant, and therefore they have a much better chance of taking over the world and changing people's mind. Whether it will be for good or bad, that's a different question. Okay, well, I'm afraid we have run out of time there, uh, and I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up the session. Thank you all for coming uh, and for some very uh, excellent questions. If you want a, a further glimpse into uh, Yuval's uh, imaginative story, I think <laughs> copies are on sale outside. Uh, um, but thank you all, thank you all very much, and please uh, uh, join me in thanking Yuval Harari. <laughs>